Uh, and today we have a presentation that I got just that way uh, from Kumar Vijay Mishra from the U.S. Army Research Labs, who's going to be talking about uh, the exciting concept of combined uh, communication and radar in distributed systems. So thanks again for presenting and looking forward to seeing your talk. Okay, thank you, uh, Dustin. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on wherever you are. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, for this opportunity. And uh, uh, I'm very excited uh, to talk about uh, uh, some uh, ongoing developments in uh, joint radar communications uh, in general, and then specifically uh, about uh, the latest trend in this area, which is towards uh, distributed systems. So I would like to acknowledge a number of my collaborators uh, uh, with whom I've been working for many years, um, uh, and they're all listed here from ARL, Luxembourg, uh, Texas, Dallas, uh, 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 from Columbia, Industrial University of Santander uh, in Columbia, uh, and, and many others, as you will see in the references. Uh, this research is uh, sponsored by uh, the Army Research Laboratory, uh, as well as the National Academies of uh, Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, the views and conclusions contained in this document are those of the authors and should not be interpreted as representing the official policies of the Army Research Laboratory or the U.S. government. Uh, so uh, one of the graphics that you see here is uh, from uh, this television show for all mankind on Apple TV. Uh, which is set uh, uh, a few de decades ago, but uh, uh, in one of the episodes, they discuss uh, the concept of interference uh, in the spectrum. Uh, and uh, uh, this problem of joint radar communications really has its origin several decades ago. You can see uh, papers on joint radar communications as far as back in 1950s and 1960s. In fact, there used to be an IEEE journal on just RF, uh, RF interference, uh, which was stopped later on. And now we are coming back to this concept of uh, uh, how we can minimize the interference from one emitter to the other. Uh, currently, uh, the reason why we are looking into uh, this joint radar communications a lot, uh, uh, the current trend, obviously this problem is common across many different applications in sensing and communications, and we'll, we'll talk about them in a little bit. Uh, but uh, in general, why we are talking about distributed systems, the motivation for that comes from two major trends. One is in the wireless communications uh, uh, industry, uh, where it has been envisaged uh, that uh, in, in the recent futures, there will be a massive number of connected devices. So the data traffic, uh, storage, uh, and uh, as well as several, uh, uh, as well as demand for high quality wireless services is supposed to increase manifold. As you can see from this uh, graphic uh, uh, based on some industry reports, so how to support this uh, demand of massively connected devices as well as uh, uh, this uh, uh, increased uh, uh, data rates. So for this, we uh, turn to uh, the Shannon for, uh, uh, formula as a guide. Uh, so the Shannon capacity tells us that uh, uh, it is dependent on uh, uh, these three parameters, N, which is the number of orthogonal uh, resources Sources uh, could be frequencies, time slots, uh, antennas, uh, and so on. W, which is the bandwidth, and then SINR, that is the signal to interference uh, plus noise ratio. Uh, the capacity, because of this logarithmic de dependence on SINR, uh, we would have to increase SINR a lot to actually see any appreciable increase in the capacity. However, we can play with these two other parameters, N and W. Uh, uh, that means you increase the bandwidth and that will uh, 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 result in this uh, increase in capacity or you increase the number of resources. For example, you can do, uh, you can uh, employ MIMO communications uh, where number of antennas are increased and that uh, results in increase in capacity. So let's look at W. Uh, now, obviously spectrum is a, a scarce natural resource and uh, uh, several regulatory uh, bodies, they have been involved in allocating spectrum to different services. So even though we would like uh, W to increase, we cannot arbitrarily increase it. 
And then even if you would like to increase this, for example, we could go, uh, currently the sub six gigahertz band is very crowded. We could go to millimeter wave band or sub terahertz range, but then not every frequency is useful because attenuation also increases as we, in general, uh, uh, as we increase in frequency, uh, uh, go higher up in the frequencies. Uh, as this graphic from uh, Ericsson shows us. So, uh, but however, there are windows of opportunities within the spectrum where there are uh, atmospheric windows or regions of uh, local minima uh, where we could do uh, that kind of transmission. So there are a lot of issues involved if you would like to increase uh, W. And then, as I mentioned, this problem of uh, uh, spectrum allocation and uh, uh, radar systems would like to have uh, increased uh, bandwidth uh, for, for reasons that we'll uh, see in a bit. Communication uh, uh, systems also want this bandwidth and the fight for uh, more bandwidth has been going on uh, as long as uh, these uh, wireless systems have been in play. For example, as you can see from these headlines from 1986, 2012, and even 2021, uh, uh, there has been a lot of uh, conflicts and contests uh, going on uh, about uh, uh, each carrier uh, wanting to have more bandwidth for itself. And uh, obviously, we can't uh, give this bandwidth exclusively to just one particular service. So, so far, uh, until the sub-660 gigahertz band, uh, we have been allocating uh, those uh, uh, bands exclusively for certain services, even though those services may not be using that particular frequency all the time. So uh, that uh, uh, may require sharing of those bands uh, between different services. So that is one motivation for this joint radar communications. Uh, the second recent motivation uh, are the developments in modern autonomous vehicles. Uh, so as you can see from this graphic taken from various uh, industry sources, modern sensor-driven vehicles uh, employ several different sensors, uh, GPS, LiDAR, cameras, uh, ultrasonic sensor, RF, and uh, thermal sensors, and then as well as radar. And the job of all these sensors, it's not just to guide the uh, uh, that vehicle in a crowded traffic environment or a complex traffic environment, but also to monitor the physiological behavior of the driver and passengers. For example, several cars these days are fitted with uh, devices that can uh, measure the heartbeat or, or different vital signs uh, of the uh, passengers and driver. Uh, and then also monitor the health of the car, for example, tire pressure, and all those things can be like chronically monitored these days. And among these different sensors, three are very common. Uh, we have a high resolution camera that provides uh, semantic information and uh, um, uh, it can uh, uh, do very good uh, performance uh, for a near range uh, visuals. Uh, but then when the visibility is low and there is adverse weather, uh, uh, then its performance uh, is not optimal. Uh, and then it cannot also directly measure Doppler velocity of the targets. Usually it infers it uh, based on the frame rate. Uh, we have LiDAR, which has been uh, very uh, popular uh, among uh, autonomous uh, vehicle manufacturers, but then it is very expensive, even though it provides a very uh, high range resolution. And then for aesthetic reasons, uh, also uh, some manufacturers, they do not prefer LiDAR because uh, you have to mount it separately on top of the car. Uh, and, and that is uh, not desirable uh, for uh, sometimes aesthetic reasons and sometimes also because it may, it may require mechanical scanning. Uh, and then uh, radar is one sensor uh, which uh, is very robust uh, to low visibility because visibility doesn't really affect uh, radar propagation. Uh, and then uh, uh, also uh, to harsh weather, at least for a shorter range, it can uh, detect Doppler directly. Uh, and then uh, uh, it's also a low cost uh, sensor compared to these uh, compared to LiDAR, for example. Uh, and the cost is very important in automotive industry. Uh, a document uh, released by General Motors a few years ago stipulated uh, no more than $100 uh, for a radar sensor per vehicle in mass production. So to meet that kind of a target, it's very difficult uh, with uh, these other sensors, but the radar uh, is, uh, is very useful uh, to meet all of these different kinds of objectives. So as we see, 
these modern cars, they are software managed. Uh, as I mentioned, a number of uh, functions, as you can see from this graphic, uh, uh, they are monitored through uh, uh, complex uh, uh, this um, computer driven chips. Uh, and then they are also connected. So cars today, they may communicate uh, with different vehicles on road or with the infrastructure, which we call as V2X, uh, or may have uh, some satellite connection, etc. So because they are software managed and connected, they actually generate a lot of data, uh, these modern cars. Uh, and you can see uh, some um, uh, numbers here uh, from uh, these sources that I've taken them from. And the current wireless technologies at sub six gigahertz like DSRC or CB2X, uh, they are uh, not capable to, uh, of supporting this kind of huge data rate. Ergo, we must move to higher uh, frequencies where more bandwidth is available, like millimeter wave. So uh, if we want uh, uh, cars to stay connected and also sense accurately, because uh, uh, in a radar system, the range resolution uh, is directly connected with the bandwidth. Higher the bandwidth, higher the range resolution. So in order to sense very accurately and stay connected, we need to increase the bandwidth. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, bandwidth is a scarce. Uh, so uh, uh, we, we need to share it uh, uh, with other emitters in this case as well. So here's the IEEE uh, spectrum allocation for various radar as well as communications uh, uh, across different bands. Uh, so I was talking about earlier that this problem of uh, interference from communications to radar and vice versa is not new. So for example, in 1980s, VHF and UHF bands, uh, 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 the foliage penetration radar used to operate in those bands, uh, uh, it, it still does. And uh, uh, they started encountering problems of uh, interference from TV and broadcast stations. Uh, in the foliage penetration radar. and But the bandwidth of this uh, FOPEN radar was so huge that at the receivers, they could just notch out those uh, interfering frequencies without any significant degradation in the performance. However, as we move higher up in the bands uh, where the, that uh, ultra wide band systems uh, may not be uh, uh, that much common, uh, in that case, this simple notching out of frequencies does not work. We need to figure out a way uh, to develop systems where uh, both radar and communications can access the spectrum together uh, without causing uh, any degradation in performance or interference uh, uh, to each other. So there have been uh, several uh, efforts uh, in past 10 years. So DARPA had uh, SSPARC program, which was about spectrum sharing between s band radar and s band communications. And then NSF in its EARS program uh, expanded it uh, to different, uh, to all parts of the spectrum. Uh, later on, it went to, uh, uh, there, there have been uh, other programs like PAR, Spectrum X for uh, radio astronomy, um, uh, researchers, uh, NRDZ, nerds, SWIFT, etc. And then uh, you can see some headlines here. Uh, 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 that there has been problems uh, uh, in uh, uh, FAA has been encountering the, this problem in C band because of this radio altimeters uh, and then 5G uh, ca carrier transmission. Uh, in radio astronomy, there, have been, there has been interference from satellites and uh, astronomers are unable uh, to make very clean observations because of these interference. So there are various uh, applications where this interference from one emitter to the other sensing and communications is becoming more common. So, uh, and that has given rise uh, to this concept of joint radar communications and it has become a very, uh, a hot topic for research uh, in past five or six years, although its origins could be traced back uh, to, like as I said, to 1960s and 70s itself. So let's look at some of the topologies for uh, joint radar communications, also known as integrated sensing and communications or ISEC. There are several terms. Uh, sometimes it's also called dual function radar communications or DFRC. So depending on how the uh, a transmitter and receiver, they are shared between communications and radar, uh, we could broadly classify Isaac uh, in these four groups. There are many other classification uh, 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 criteria as we'll look into that uh, in a bit, but these are just four broad uh, uh, categories. So when both transmitter and receiver for comms and radar, they are not shared, 
and uh, they independently access uh, the channel, then we call it a coexistence scenario. So because the hardware is not common and even the waveforms are not, uh, in this case, there is interference from radar to comms and comms to radar. But in a spectral coexistence uh, uh, philosophy, uh, the goal of radar and comms receiver is to develop in, uh, efficient receiver signal processing techniques that minimize the interference from one another. Uh, then uh, if any one of the TXRX is uh, uh, shared, uh, then uh, uh, we, we call it spectral co-design. And among these, uh, uh, if you see this D, uh, where both transmit receiver, they are shared between comms and radar. And I give an example uh, from one of our papers of a vehicular scenario, where this red car uh, is the transmitter and um, uh, it transmits uh, a common waveform for radar and communication. So the waveform has uh, communications messages embedded in it, and it goes to this target T2, which is the blue car reflected back to the receiver, which is RX car. And uh, this is not in the line of sight of uh, the transmitter. And at the receiver, uh, the goal uh, is to extract uh, target parameters like the location and Doppler velocity of T2, as well as decode the communication messages from TX. So this bi-static uh, joint radar communications broadcast uh, is a very, uh, is a more general example of spectral co-design. As I mentioned earlier, that there are many ways in which we can classify these systems. Uh, so depending on channel access, whether it is independent or it is coordinated, that, will, that means uh, radar and communications, they share some information uh, that, okay, now the spectrum is free and you can use it. Uh, or it is joined, both are together using it, but there is a common waveform. Uh, so uh, there could be, this could be one way to classify Isaac systems. Based on hardware, we just saw uh, based on uh, whether TXRX are separate or common waveforms, whether waveforms are separate, common, or uh, they're resource shared, like you may be uh, using different waveforms, but uh, in different uh, time slots. So that's another way uh, to classify the systems. And then uh, based on performance or functionality, there could be a radar-centric ISAC where the primary goal is to uh, in, uh, optimize the radar performance uh, with some uh, acceptable uh, deterioration in communications or vice versa. So you can uh, classify them as radar centric, com centric, and when both are optimized and joint radar comps and so on. Uh, then how these uh, nodes are located. So if it is co-located, that is TXRX, all antennas are at the same place. Bi-static, we just saw in a vehicular scenario. And distributed, where all TXRX, they, they are not at the same place. Uh, they may or may not be networked. They may be heterogeneous. That means all nodes uh, are not same kind of radars. One node could be phased array, another one could be MIMO, and so on. So there, uh, there is the, that classification as well. And we are going to talk about distributed more uh, in this talk. And there are various specialized ways. There could be full duplex, and now we have new architectures based on intelligent surfaces, uh, or depending on uh, what kind of frequencies we are using, or whether it is classical or quantum. So there have been several, several initiatives within IEEE. So uh, IEEE Communication Society has Isaac Emerging Technology Initiative, uh, which looks into this. Uh, in Signal Processing Society, also we have an Isaac Technical Working Group uh, in Aerospace and Electronic Systems Society. Uh, I'm leading uh, the Radar Systems Panels uh, uh, Isaac Initiative. Uh, in uh, Radio Science uh, in Commission C that I'm a vice chair of, there also we have some initiatives related to this. Uh, and I'm sure in GRSS, this particular technical committee uh, uh, under which this uh, um, uh, webinar is organized, uh, uh, also has uh, some initiatives related to this, I guess. So let's look into the distributed Isaac considerations. Uh, so uh, uh, the motivation again is that in the future, the networks are going to be most decentralized. So for example, if you consider a traffic scenario, uh, a vehicular Isaac, there are so many cars with uh, their own radar and communication system. So it becomes a distributed Isaac problem. Uh, and then obviously we have discussed the need of uh, uh, this joint radar communications uh, uh, given the current wireless network, uh, wi wireless communications industry trends. 
So as the networks become more decentralized and edge focused, that means uh, focusing on the nodes which are at the edge of the network, uh, which are uh, uh, far away from some centralized uh, server. Uh, then uh, in that case to cater for this uh, uh, future uh, uh, distributed uh, Isaac, uh, we need to focus uh, uh, on, on this kind of uh, system uh, nowadays. So what are the considerations? So obviously one is the complexity. There are so many nodes, how to optimize them for uh, an efficient Isaac operation uh, is a challenge. Synchronization, because uh, different transmitters are transmitting at different times. And uh, uh, again, how, how can we coordinate uh, uh, the access to the spectrum? Uh, in, uh, uh, in distributed radars, uh, typically the performance is characterized as statistically. For example, the channel itself is modeled statistically because the radar cross-section of the target does not appear identical to all transmit receive pairs. So the ambiguity functions definition is statistical, for example, in uh, radar. So that is another consideration here. We need to work on low complexity algorithms because if the network is huge, uh, uh, speed definitely matters uh, how to process all this data. So low complexity algorithms are required. Uh, then there are some specific uh, cases, for example, data association. So uh, people who work on distributed or multi-static radars uh, would recall that uh, uh, when there are multiple targets present, then we have to resort to probabilistic data association uh, to uh, assign which echo came from which target at each receiver. Uh, we also have uh, recent trends of uh, duplexing channels, uh, or full duplex channels uh, in uh, wireless comms, and uh, it has also been um, considered in 3GPP uh, document nowadays. So in full duplex, we use uh, the same channel. Uh, 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 it, it, there are two flavors of full duplex. One is you may have two-way communications over two channels, and then there is in-band full duplex where there's the same channel, but two-way communications at the same time. And typically self-interference cancelers are employed at the receiver uh, to cancel out interference from the transmitter. There may or may not be a fusion center in the distributed case. So that is something to be, uh, uh, to be considered. Uh, and there are many different architectures. We'll see some examples later uh, on uh, of this distributed uh, systems. So this was all the motivation. Now we are going to look at some examples. Um, uh, I'll start with uh, one very, very quick example on communication sensitive weather radar and follow it with uh, uh, a full example of this full duplex distributed uh, Isaac code design. Then we are going to look into some other interesting uh, works that we have been doing recently, depending on uh, the time we have uh, under the dual blind deconvolution and these other architectures. So let's look into a, a very interesting example of communication aided weather radar uh, that could uh, uh, also um, uh, uh, give a very uh, good insight on how distributed systems, they come into play in some uh, very common applications uh, uh, related to ISAC. So here, this is a project we have been doing with a European company and University of Luxembourg. Uh, and the goal here is as follows. Uh, we have a communication satellite at millimeter wave band uh, that uh, uh, communicates with the user terminals. Um, uh, and then the signal that uh, propagates uh, through the atmosphere, uh, it obviously has some information about uh, uh, the precipitation content in the atmosphere. So in general, when we want to uh, estimate precipitation, we employ weather radars, but weather radars are huge and uh, they, are not, uh, uh, it, it, they are not deployed in uh, developing regions of the world. And even in developed countries, for example, in the US, um, as you move away from the radar, uh, the beam uh, uh, is touching the cloud tops and we are not getting enough information from the lower troposphere when you're far away from these uh, S-band radars of National Weather Service. So it's uh, difficult to put these big radars uh, at every location, but we do have these communications user terminals spread all across the world. For example, 300,000 user terminals just in Europe and 2 million worldwide. And uh, they do get uh, some signal information uh, about the precipitation uh, because of this communication with the satellite. So could we use that information 
uh, to estimate frame rate. So that is one of the problems we have been looking at. And I am also doing a very similar project with the Rice University, uh, where we are looking uh, into a massive MIMO base station and how it can actually uh, do extraction of rainfall content from the signal uh, that it receives. Uh, so the problem here is uh, uh, the, es the estimation of rain rate R in weather radar uh, uh, is equipped with uh, several other observables. You, you get uh, reflectivity, or if it is a dual pol polarized uh, radar, then a lot of dual polarimetric observables uh, could also be retrieved. And all of that uh, massive information is useful in very accurately estimating rainfall rate. However, in this particular case, all we get at the user terminals uh, is power. Uh, and we know what power was transmitted, what, uh, what was the signal power when it was transmitted. So we can find out how much attenuation uh, uh, the signal suffered while going through the precipitation medium. So just from this attenuation data, how to accurately estimate R, that is the challenge. Now in millimeter wave radars, uh, uh, typically, as I mentioned, they have additional parameters. Uh, and uh, uh, at millimeter wave uh, R, that is rainfall rate and specific attenuation, that is, uh, 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 which is the first derivative of uh, attenuation with respect to the range, uh, we call it AH, H for horizontal polarization. They have a linear relationship, uh, although it can get perturbed uh, by these other uh, factors like wind shear, storm types, and intensities. But in millimeter wave radars, all of these uh, uh, things could be accounted for because you're observing other, uh, uh, because you're monitoring other parameters too. But here, all we get is the uh, uh, attenuation. So in this particular case, how to accurately estimate R? One way is you can just use ITU uh, provided uh, uh, relationship uh, parameters, but then it is not very accurate. So the way we deal with this is uh, using deep learning networks. So for example, uh, uh, we train a network, could be LSTM, CNN, uh, and we have tried several others um, using uh, uh, an in situ instrument like rain gauges in that particular area, uh, as well as a co-located uh, weather radar. And later on during the prediction stage, uh, we provide uh, the real time uh, uh, attenuation information from the user terminals and then the network predicts uh, the rainfall rate. So we did this uh, uh, particular experiment using the data from Southwest Germany. We had about uh, 30 to 40 uh, terminals here. Uh, in a 20 kilometer by 20 kilometer area as shown by this rectangle. Uh, and then we applied this, uh, 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 we trained the network uh, using the co-located rain gauges and uh, radar, the German weather service DWD radar. Uh, and then here are some results for a single terminal here. So in this case, uh, what you see here, the satellite link, uh, it very closely follows the accumulated rain, uh, 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 which uh, we are comparing with, with our German uh, weather service radar. So this is for accumulated rain, and this is for the instantaneous rainfall rate. And now, because it's a distributed system, we train all the user terminals with this and then generate a map. So here is our first uh, uh, take at this. What you see on the right side uh, is what the German weather service is. And these are the maps generated. Uh, as I said, this is the first take. We'll see a more improved version in a bit. Uh, and what we're seeing here is that it is uh, this termin these terminals are uh, roughly capturing the direction and intensities of the storm. Then we improve this using these different types of uh, 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 networks. So as I said, you can use CNN, L LSTM, and in various other combinations, yeah, you can find more details in our paper. And then uh, with one of these improved version, this is the result we get for cramps. So uh, in this case, uh, you see the what the radar sees and what the uh, our satellite link shows. They are actually very very close, and uh, we have done this. So here you can see for uh, uh, different at different in, uh, hours from the radar in this panel, and the bottom panel is what the deep network is showing. They're, they're actually pretty close, and here is a movie which uh, captures this. So. Uh, uh, the radar is on the left side and our uh, user terminals, as you can see from this black dots, there are thousands of terminals and fans. 
uh, that, that is on the right side and uh, generated this rainfall rate uh, estimates uh, are generated through the deep network. And we have done this for other countries. Uh, so Switzerland is very difficult because it's mountainous, we're still working on it. But for Germany, France, uh, results are uh, actually very good. So that, that is an example of a communications aided uh, or a radar aided communications estimate of rainfall rate in a distributed case. That's a very practical example. Now let's look at some of the theoretical um, considerations in this case. So we would consider a full duplex distributed ISAC with, uh, uh, in a, under a co-design scenario. So people who are not familiar with uh, uh, the non-collocated MIMO. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, the goal here is whether you do it in downlink or uplink, the goal is to provide better service at the cell edge. And uh, you may have some support for, uh, uh, infra infrastructure wise, as well as protocol wise in order to uh, perform the non-collocated MIMO that is without a base station. And there are various terminologies here, the centralized version. So as I have mentioned earlier, there may or may not be a fusion center or a central server. So there could be a centralized version of this. There could be distributed and then uh, several others. So you can find in this paper uh, uh, by uh, my colleagues from University of Luxembourg, uh, where they have uh, dealt with different types of uh, uh, architectures for non-collocated MIMO. So uh, you need some synchronization in this case. Uh, so we have been discussing synchronization as well. And the goal is to form very large virtual arrays that can uh, help uh, with this high quality uh, service. In case of radar, the distributed radar, uh, uh, so as against a co-located MIMO radar, in a widely distributed MIMO radar, the radar cross-section uh, is not identical to each TXRX pair because each TXRX pair, uh, they are separated by huge distances. So uh, uh, here, the goal is to exploit the spatial diversity of the target. For example, if there's a stealth aircraft, uh, then uh, the backscatter in that case is very low. But then uh, if we could spread the network of radars on the ground far and wide, then uh, some, uh, uh, some other receiver may be able to capture uh, this uh, high strength backscatter in that case and detect the target. So that is uh, usually the classical application of uh, distributed MIMO data. It is also called statistical MIMO, as I discussed earlier, a lot of uh, analysis in theory is done statistically because RCSS model does a random variable because it's not identical in all directions. Uh, so we model the channel uh, uh, as a random variable in this case. Uh, and uh, then here is an example from one of our papers. So the RX uh, receivers, they are uh, located in this circle and then TX, there are three transmitters and then together they are trying to detect this target in green color. Uh, so how do we model in this case? So typically uh, we have a delay, uh, so in time delay uh, uh, at the receiver uh, from the transmit to target and target to receiver. That time delay directly tells us about the location of the target with respect to the transmitter and receiver. Uh, so we model it uh, 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 using this formula given here using the position coordinates of the uh, target as well as the TXRX. Similarly, Doppler frequency with respect to each receiver could also be modeled uh, by using this inner product as shown here. So this is just to show uh, how uh, different or complex the problem becomes when we are considering distributed MIMO radars. And then I talked about the ambiguity function. So typically ambiguity function characterizes a radar's ability to distinguish between two very closely spaced targets. And uh, uh, the way we compute it is by correlating the transmit waveform with, his, with its time delayed and uh, Doppler delayed replicas. However, in a distributed case, because there are so many receivers and so many transmitters, we don't have that very nice definition of ambiguity function. We must deal uh, with this statistical uh, definition of ambiguity function. And when you plot it, uh, then these are the kind of figures you get uh, where uh, the intensity, uh, the color intensity uh, on each one of these graphs, uh, it actually uh, tells us where the target could be detected uh, or distinguished uh, 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 much better than the other regions, depending on the location of transmitter and receiver. So the circle and triangles here are the location of TXRX 
and then uh, the color or these ellipses that you're seeing that is telling us that uh, if the target is within this region then we have a better chance of distinguishing it compared to the other region so this is how we theoretically analyze um, the distributed radars now let's come to the case where we have a distributed MIMO radar and we also have this uh, distributed communication system. So both are distributed and both are trying to access the same channel, the same spectrum together. So we call it co-design MRMC, that is joint MIMO radar, MIMO comms. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, target RCS is not identical. Um, and here we are also considering some kind of cooperation between radar and uh, the downlink reflected signal because the downlink reflected signal also comes from the target and radar could possibly use that additional information to enhance the target detection and estimation performance. Uh, and this is also full duplex system. Uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the in-band full duplex, which is another uh, more recent uh, uh, version of full duplex. Now, whenever we are trying to jointly design a radar communication system, we need a common matrix. Uh, which uh, which we'll use to optimize various system parameters. So uh, radar and communications, both of them have different objectives. In case of radar, we are interested in probability of detection, root mean square error, if it is uh, estimates or lower error bounds or tracking error. Uh, in case of communications, it is bit error rate, uh, spectral efficiency, those kind of parameters. So these parameters are very different for both systems very rarely there is a common matrix that we could use. So that's why we had all those radar-centric and comm-centric versions of ISAC. So what do we use here? Uh, here we resort to mutual information as a matrix. So for communications, we know mutual information directly tells us about the data rate. In case of radar, uh, Michael Bell uh, had this paper in 1990s where they discuss how mutual information could also be used for radar waveform design or to characterize a, a, a radar performance parameters. So in, in that particular, considering the, that kind of uh, theory, uh, here we decided to use mutual information to design radar waveforms and communications decoders and filters at the receiver. Um, uh, we did a, our own flavor on mutual information. So we used a compounded and weighted uh, some in mutual information, which actually considers some of these distributed uh, 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 characteristics uh, in the MRMC design. And we also have these practical constraints, how much power could be used, quality of service, or for a waveform peak to average power ratio, we consider these as well. So here is a transmit signal model. Uh, so both uh, uplink UE and uh, base station transmitter, they're transmitting their frames. So the only thing here that we are assuming is that uh, uh, the common observation intervals are the same. So uh, uh, the frame and the PRI transmission, they, their intervals are same, although they may not be synchronized. For example, here the radar transmitter transmits at a different time, but within that same interval. Uh, and we can write equations here for the ULUE as well as base station transmitter. As you can see in the uh, uplink uh, user uh, equipment or ULUE, we have the precoders that we are going to design. We have the data stream that, that uh, is transmitted uh, uh, by the UE. Um, and then in case of uh, base station, we have its own precoder that we have to design. So in both cases, we have to design these precoders uh, for an optimized performance. And in case of radar, we want to trans, uh, we want to design this uh, code, uh, the waveform code. When we look at the receive model, so here uh, I've plotted the, uh, what all is received at the base station, downlink UE, as well as the MIMO radar. So the, just one of the MIMO radar receivers, that is NR, and then uh, the same analysis could be applied across different uh, receivers. So uh, we see at the uh, uh, at the ba from base base at the base station receiver uh, we have the uplink signal uh, that we would like to decode. We have the multi-user interference that is from other um, uh, users. Uh, we have uh, the self interference. We have the interference from radar signal, which is this RB, and then we have noise. At the downlink UE, similarly, we have the downlink signal, multi-user interference. We have interference from the uplink, radar, and then the noise. The radar part is interesting because I have the radar signal reflected from the target. 
I also have the downlink or the communication signals that was reflected from the target. So this also has useful target information. And then I have all kinds of interference clutter and noise. So uh, here we would like to actually exploit this downlink reflected signal to actually enhance the performance uh, of, of radar. So you could actually use it to your advantage. That's what that's the goal of this work. So we do this CWSM maximization that is our own mutual information matrix as uh, I mentioned earlier. So it's kind of a weighted matrix which trades off between uh, which performance you would like to optimize, mode, radar, communications are both equally. Uh, and uh, you can write this using the standard uh, information and communication theory uh, concepts. So we have this uh, problem, uh, very non-convex problem that we would like to maximize the CWSM uh, subject to all these constraints, which are related to power uh, rates and the uh, peak to average uh, uh, ratio for the waveform. It is non-convex, very difficult to solve. So the way we solve it is we use, uh, we solve it iteratively. We fix one of the uh, constraints and then we solve the problem and then iterate with the other set of con constraints and so on until convergence. So we do this using block coordinate descent algorithm, which has been uh, shown to have uh, an excellent performance for problems like these. So uh, the first uh, thing that we do is uh, we have the CWSM maximization problem. There has been uh, works by Professor Rick Blum at Lehigh University uh, where they have shown that the CWSM maximization could be converted into minimization of a minimum mean square error. Uh, the two problems are equivalent. And when you convert it to this minimization of me, uh, minimum mean, mean square error, then we have, uh, 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 then we can make this algorithm more tractable. So that's what we do. We uh, exploit that equivalence uh, and uh, uh, convert uh, uh, this CWSM maximization to MMSE minimization. And then we employ to tackle the uh, rate constraints, which are again um, uh, problematic uh, in the problem. Uh, we actually linearize them using Taylor series expansion. And then we solve this problem for the radar waveform part, which is the power constraint. Uh, we uh, separate that problem out of this big problem and we solve it using matrix nearness uh, uh, technique. So uh, here, here is the theorem uh, that appears in our paper where we talk about uh, conversion of maximization problem to minimization problem. And then here is the flow of this algorithm. So subproblem one will give us the peak order and some estimate of the radar waveform. In subproblem two, we'll refine that estimate and then we'll iterate between them. So after doing all of this, here are some of the results. So here we are showing the radar performance. So for example, probability of detection uh, is compared with the threshold uh, or a probability of false alarm. And what we see here is that we have these different uh, state of the art techniques that we compare them with, and then black is our proposed. So when there is no cooperation, that is the dotted line, the performance is the worst. By no cooperation, what we mean is that we discard the downlink reflected signal at the radar receiver, and we only try to get uh, do the detection and estimation through the radar reflected signal. But then because there was so much interference, the performance is uh, very bad. But then when we actually try to exploit uh, that additional signal, then the performance goes up. And uh, it, it uh, de definitely uh, is an improvement over other codes. Now, there are these other plots that you are seeing, which are better than uh, this joint radar uh, comps. But then those are uh, not optimized for the communications performance. They are, uh, they are doing better because they are only optimized for the radar performance. And here's a communications case where we are comparing this mutual information with respect to the SNR and then uh, uh, SNR. And then uh, uh, here also we show that our proposed uh, decoders, they actually provide uh, a better uh, rate compared to these other classical methods. So this was a full example of a distributed uh, design uh, of uh, 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 distributed co-design uh, for MIMO radar and MIMO communications. 
So we have seen a practical example. We have seen a theoretical example. Now I'm going to talk about some of the other recent and interesting uh, uh, topics that we have been exploring. And one of them is this dual blind deconvolution. So this, this part I'll be rather quick because I just want to give, uh, uh, give an idea of what we are trying to do. So here is a problem that we consider where the radar is passive and uh, communications uh, channel is very dynamic. So uh, in general, in a radar problem, we don't know the, the information about the target that uh, or the radar channel is unknown, but the radar transmit signal is known at the receiver. In communications the reverse, the communication transmits channel is unknown, uh, the communication transmit signal is unknown, but the channel could be estimated a priori because the channel remains more or less the same for a, a, a big duration, uh, uh, a big observation intervals. But in a passive radar, we don't know the uh, transmit signal either. So in that case, both transmit signal as well as the channel are unknown. And in dynamic communications, like the millimeter wave uh, channels that we talked about, uh, their uh, coherence times are very short. So we don't have enough information about the channel either. So in this case, both channel and uh, transmit signal uh, are unknown. Now, if we want to do a joint radar communications for these kinds of systems, we don't know the transmit signal or channels of either of them. And if we have an overlaid receiver, we are, you're, uh, receiving both the radar and communication signal where we don't have any information about the channel or the receiver, it becomes a very highly ill posed problem. So we can, uh, if we have to write that problem out, so typically for the radar, we'll have a transmit signal X that is convolved with its channel R and then same for communications. And when they are superimposed at the receiver, we put an addition sign and then from the, the observation why we want to get all four parameters. In general, it's not possible. It's a very highly imposed problem. Uh, and we call this as a dual blind deconvolution problem. So deconvolution is when we have just one of these convolutions and H is unknown and we would like to get this. It's a classical problem. Blind deconvolution is you have just one of the convolutions and both are unknown and you would like to uh, 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 retrieve both of them. In dual blind, we have the summation, it's, it's very difficult. So the way we do this is, as I'll show you, uh, we employ theories from atomic norm minimization, uh, which is almost now 10 years old theory and has been exploited in many problems, many imposed problems like phase retrieval, super resolution, uh, and so on. We actually employ those theories to solve this problem. Uh, the key here are, uh, uh, is the assumption of sparsity, that the channels are sparse. So they are definitely sparse at, at millimeter wave and terahertz. And for radar also, if we are considering, we are not considering volumetric targets, then uh, the channel is sparse for radar as well. So it's a very practical uh, um, uh, assumption. And then uh, uh, for the radar, we assume that the transmit uh, uh, signal is a train of pulses. So it's periodically, uh, it's like a pulse Doppler radar, periodically transmitting these pulses. Uh, the channel is the delay and Doppler channel. So targets have delay and Doppler. You can extend it uh, to angles also. If you're using an array radar, we'll, we'll see an example of that in a bit. Communication signal is the classical OFDM communication signal. And then the communications channel, uh, OFDM communication channel is also a delayed of the channel. We substitute these expressions and then we get uh, the expression of the received signal as this. The goal is to actually get alpha R and all these other unknown parameters that I've listed here related to the transmit signals, as well as the target and communication channels. So uh, the way we do this is uh, we actually, uh, express the transmit signals in a low dimensional subspace. This is similar to the lifting trick, which is employed in phase retrieval problems. And we assume that the channels are sparse. So channels are assumed as sparse, transmit signals uh, are uh, uh, represent that we do this low dimensional subspace representation. After you do this and with some algebra, you could actually write the received signal uh, in this uh, discrete linear sensing model as this. We are uh, Aleph R and Aleph C, they are the uh, fu linear functions of matrices ZR and ZC, and all unknown parameters of radar and communications, they are encapsulated between this ZR and ZC matrices as shown here. 
uh, we deploy this atomic norm minimization framework, which is a generalization of uh, L1 norm. Uh, so here the domain could be arbitrary. So if uh, the domain could, uh, in this particular case, the domain is uh, uh, the, the atoms or the dictionary uh, is a rank one uh, matrix, uh, a bunch of rank one, rank one matrices. So we can define those atomic sets as rank one matrices here, and then corresponding atomic norm could be written here, uh, as uh, here. Now the signal uh, retrieval or the channel retrieval problem, uh, we, we write it as minimization of the sum of these atomic norms. And these atomic norms are multivariate atomic norms. They are not univariate. So it's a very complicated problem subject to these observations. So if we can get ZRZC from ZRZC, we can actually extract uh, all the unknown target parameters as well as the, um, the signal information. Uh, the way to solve this is we employ uh, from control theory, bounded real lemma and uh, theories of positive trigonometric polynomials, which allow us to convert that primal problem in a dual problem as shown here. And then using BRL, we convert the constraints uh, to these linear matrix inequalities. This gives us a semi-definite program that we can solve on computer. So you can see more details in our paper on each one of this. Uh, uh, and typically, I do a tutorial for the, just for this segment. So I, I'll, uh, the key idea here is that using these theories of trigonometric polynomials and bounded real lemma, you could actually convert that intractable primal problem into a semi-definite program that we can solve. We provide guarantees here uh, that uh, how many minimum number of samples you need so that you can recover ZR and ZC uh, with a very high probability. Um, and then here are some examples where we are plotting the dual polynomial from the optimization problem. And then wherever it achieves a maximum modulus of unity, that's where the targets or the communication parameters they lie. And this is how we actually retrieve them. You can extend this to an array radar, as I mentioned earlier, where you will have a direction of arrival as an additional unknown parameter for both of them. And then similarly, you form this uh, primal problem, dual problem, but with a positive hyper optin uh, trigonometric polynomials, that is the higher dimension version. And then again, you localize them by looking at the dual polynomial. So, and we have done a lot of work on this dual blind deconvolution. Uh, military is specifically interested in that uh, because uh, uh, military receivers uh, usually are listening uh, to um, uh, to emissions where they don't have enough information. So this is very useful for those kind of uh, 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 scenarios as well. Uh, very quickly, I'll just uh, give an overview of other distributed Isaac uh, architectures, and then we'll do some Q&A. So another uh, uh, architecture that we are looking into is intelligent reflecting surfaces, which is a recent development uh, uh, wherein you can combine the analog uh, uh, devices with the antenna aperture and hence uh, save, uh, 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 this gives a lot of savings in size, weight, area, uh, and uh, computational cost. And these uh, uh, surfaces have a lot of other functions, but we are primarily interested in non-line of sight sensing and comms. So we have done a joint radar communications version of this as well, uh, where uh, uh, the uh, radar and communicate the radar target and the communication users they are blocked uh, by they are not in line of sight from this joint uh, transmitter. So you use these reflecting surfaces to actually communicate with those users and get information about the target. And then how to optimize both the IRS parameters as well as the waveform that that is the Isaac problem here. Uh, and then we have shown that with a single IRS uh, uh, compared to a single IRS. Uh, an optimal deployment of more than one IRS actually results in better sensing and communications, even in non-line of sight. Finally, uh, uh, I give a, here a graphic that shows many other things that we are doing. Uh, there are secrecy rate problems in joint radar communications. For passive cases, it is different. Uh, drone born Isaac, uh, an area of its own, heterogeneous that I had uh, referred to earlier. You can also employ sensor fusion theories uh, at the receiver. Uh, so we have done this for a vehicular scenario. And then the high, higher uh, you go in the frequency, there are additional considerations. For example, terahertz JRC, uh, there, are, there are a lot of uh, novelties uh, uh, there, and you can find more details in the references that I have provided here. 
uh, we are organizing a workshop in ICASP on ISAC. Uh, and if, if you in, uh, if you intend to attend the uh, ICASP or if you just want to visit Greece, then uh, please attend this. Uh, there are a lot of interesting panel discussions uh, and um, uh, tutorial talks uh, in this. Um, we also do a lot of work in the Synthetic Aperture Standards Committee of Signal Processing Society, where we construct these distributed architectures. Uh, there are two special issues that I want to plug in here. One is the JSTSP, uh, the Signal Processing Society special issue uh, uh, where, that I'm co-editing, uh, uh, which is about use of machine learning for Isaac that is due in May 15. And another one uh, that, that is actually with Dustin on uh, distributed synthetic apertures, uh, and they are all due in coming months. Uh, uh, please consider submitting your high quality papers to this. Uh, and I would like to plug in my upcoming book here, uh, Signal Processing for Joint Radial Communications to be published by Wiley IEEE Press. Uh, you'll find a lot of interesting articles there. Uh, so with this, uh, I would uh, like to thank all of you for listening. Wonderful, thank you very much. That's a super exciting array of problems. Um, we've got about four minutes for questions, but if you have questions, you can either put them into the chat or raise your virtual hand and I will unmute you. I guess while we wait for questions to be asked, I, I do have one myself. Um, when you were talking about using these other signals in the environment, it seems like you have these choices between changing how those signals communicate so that you can better use them either for communication or for radar or trying to use things that just happen to be in the environment that you don't have very much control over. How much change in performance is there from you having control over those signals versus not? And if you don't have control over them, would you rather they just go away or are they still sort of useful? Uh, yeah, excellent question. So, uh, I mean, if we don't have any control over them, obviously we don't know how they're accessing the spectrum. So that makes uh, the job at the receiver very difficult because, uh, uh, because the signal is not very clean, right? The interference could be anywhere. And then you have to do some additional signal processing techniques to first find out exactly where the interference lies and then how to manage it. Do you want to use it? Is there any useful information there? Uh, or is it is just interference? So some examples uh, that I presented, like the weather example, where yes. we know there is a useful information, we know exactly where it is, and then we can use it, or a downlink reflected signal, uh, those we could use. But in a dual blind case, which, which would be like, yeah. you don't know anything about it, uh, we know communication uh, information is useful in the communication signal, radar information is useful in radar signal. So we actually extract both of them, but we do not really use one for to enhance the other or like that. So I think some prior information definitely helps. Uh, in Even in the dual blind case, we are using some prior information. We know the format of the transmit signal, right? Yeah. That's OFDM or pulse of the radar. If we don't know anything about the accessing the spectrum, or then obviously the it's it's very difficult. Uh, so some information always helps. Maybe you could do some prior uh, observations of the signal. Uh, you don't transmit, let them transmit, and then try to see if there is anything useful or not. Yeah, and and does having an array where you can sort of observe that signal in multiple spaces in a distributed sort of collecting regime allow you to? between all those informations, use that signal as since you're seeing it, where it's coming from and at multiple points in time? Yeah, so spatial diversity definitely helps. Uh, we, we can exploit it um, in the sense, like I said, that for example, in a stealth aircraft, you don't get enough backscatter. So you don't know if the aircraft is there or not, but if you spread out, there's a high likelihood that one of the receivers would actually get enough backscatter. Same with these kind of interfering signals. If you spread out, uh, maybe you can capture them better and uh, exploit them. Um, yeah, but uh, we, we still need some information. You need to know something about the format or at least learn it like you can employ. For example, there's a lot of work on using learning networks, deep learning networks to first identify the signal itself. What kind of signal it is. It is LFM, NLFM, pulse Doppler radar, so once you do that kind of identification of unknown signal and then proceed with these uh, algorithms, that could also be done. All right, we have one final question here in the chat that was entered. It says, it looks like a two-part question. It says, 
My question is, how is the multipath effect handled on the receiver side? Also, when the signal path trajectory is affected by weather, such as rain, snow, how is the direction estimated? Okay, yeah, so it's, uh, I mean, those are, I would say, very, very general question because it depends on what kind of Isaac we are using. So uh, I think the multipath effect, uh, if I go back to this full duplex case where uh, multipath was generally an interference in that case, but uh, there's one, one recent work that I'm doing with um, uh, Rice University where we are actually trying to exploit multipath for better detection of the waveform from an aerial radar, like military radar, uh, airborne military radar, which is which has all the parameters classified. How do you detect that waveform? Because it is also transmitting in the same uh, frequency as uh, some of the uh, sub six gigahertz base stations. So in that case, uh, uh, we we do try to use multipath to our advantage. Uh, so you could ignore it as interference, like in these some other cases, but it all depends on what application you have and what kind of receiver capability you have. Uh, you can definitely exploit it as well for your advantage as in this other work that I mentioned. About the second question, when the signal path trajectory is affected by, I mean, I'm not sure the trajectory, I mean, it's not like it's going to bend <laughs> within the weather, it is going to get attenuated. So in rain or snow, there could be like severe attenuation. Yes, there are diffractions and all those things, especially at millimeter wave. Uh, and uh, uh, that's why in millimeter wave, we use MIMO because MIMO gives you that uh, diversity, which could actually deal with these kind of uh, diffraction losses. About the attenuation itself, um, yeah, like I said that, uh, I mean, uh, at sub six gigahertz, uh, I think the attenuation, we do have methods like in weather radar to deal with it. Otherwise, in millimeter wave where the attenuation is very significant, that's why we use uh, massive MIMO uh, array because what you lose in attenuation, you can compensate for it using beamforming gain. So that is one way to deal with this. Awesome. Well, thank you again for reaching out and for taking time to, to share this. If you have any additional questions now, feel free to email. And again, if you were inspired by this talk and want to give one yourself or know someone you'd like to see, please uh, reach out to me directly. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you.